skill sets with cell phones at the beginning levels. I'm so happy to be here with my colleague uh, Amy and Nikki. Uh, we've both, we, two of us work in the same organization, the other works in something different. So we hope we have a lot to share with you today. Okay, uh, my name is Jamie Kreil. I am a beginning, pre-beginning level ESL instructor at Cedar Riverside Adult Education Collaborative. I'm also adjunct faculty at Hamlin University um, in the ESL certificate program. Hi and good morning. I'm Amy Van Steenwick. I also work at Cedar Riverside Adult Ed as an ESL instructor and also as the volunteer coordinator. Good morning. I'm Nikki Alaldi. I'm ESL beginning ESL instructor at the Lindale Neighborhood Association and volunteer manager. So we have a couple objectives for you to pay attention to today. We'll be talking about our routines at the beginning level um, that we use to develop some component skills using cell phones in particular. Um, we're also going to discuss the, some challenges and unique opportunities that cell phones bring for us um, at the beginning levels in remote learning. And we'll take some time to reflect on how technology used in our different programs um, can facilitate skill acquisition for beginning level ESL students. Okay, just a few basic definitions for everyone. Um, Zoom, WhatsApp, phone calls are services or platforms used to deliver instruction. Cell phones, the device used to access instruction. Google Slides is a presentation program for material. So Amy, you're muted. Yep. Uh, we just want to get a little sense of um, what services or platforms people are using for instruction in the room. Um, so we have a poll um, that we're going to put out. And if you could just respond, that'll give us kind of a sense of what you all have been up to. I mean, we've been mostly on WhatsApp and Zoom and phones. Actually, we've been all over the place. Um, so I have to admit, I am having issues with the poll. And I wonder if we need to just let people use the chat. I apologize, it's not loading. Oh, no worries. Yeah, if you could chat out. Um, so like, are you using, I think our questions were, are you meeting on Schoology or Zoom? Or are you doing straight up phone calls or maybe using WhatsApp or Google Meet? Those are kind of, I think those were the ones that we mentioned on the poll, but the chat might be nice too, because then we can see if there's something that we hadn't covered. So yeah, I'm seeing uh, Remind in addition to the things that I mentioned, um, Chromebooks, Google Meet, a lot of Zoom, a lot of Zoom, <laughs> a lot of Google Meet, yep. Still some WhatsApp, Zoom and WhatsApp, that's kind of me too. And we're getting into the platforms a little, so MobiMax and Facebook, a couple of Facebooks, an email, Google Slides, Google Docs, there's an Edmentum. Um, yeah. So it looks like we're kind of, we kind of have all those bases covered. Um, so that gives us a good sense of what you guys have been doing. Oh, I see a Rosetta also mentioned. <laughs> Yay, phone calls. Yes, we still have one teacher who's primarily doing phone calls at our site as well. So I think just doing whatever works best for us to, uh, within our ability to make choices, depending on what district we're in, has been kind of nice for us as well. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm going to be talking about teaching beginning ESL. And so that's uh, CASAS 153, I should say 153, to about 181. Um, and I'm using Zoom on cell phones primarily. And um, I'm using WhatsApp to send extra activities, um, homework. Um, usually assignments up with MobyMax um, and a couple of the learning websites that we'll discuss later. 
Okay. And the thing with WhatsApp um, is that it was a unique opportunity for us because our students identified it as a platform that they were familiar with. Um, and I can also communicate via WhatsApp on the computer, which makes it easier to post videos and links to activities. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about what a typical class is like. So um, I begin my day, uh, first 20 minutes doing sort of typical day date weather stuff, um, calendar. Um, and the next 10 minutes uh, we spend on a question of the day. So uh, how are you feeling? Uh, what is the season? Etc. And 30 minutes are is allotted for the main chunk of content, um, which I'll discuss in a moment here. And the last 15 minutes are um, is homework prep. And as you can see, it's about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, most of my students are elderly um, and don't want to spend an extended period of time looking at a small screen. So that is why the class is shorter than it may be typically. Um, and like I said, they, they can get really tired from focusing on the screen. Um, sometimes their screens can be damaged or broken. And so we don't spend an extended period of time on a single task. Okay. So this is uh, what my typical class looks like mapped out on a four day week. Um, the routines are modeled after the in-person class that we had. Um, so Mondays are allotted for vocabulary, Tuesday for phonics, Wednesdays for conversation and Thursdays for sight words and fluency practice. And within each of these, we really work on speaking, listening and reading and cell phones lend themselves to that. Um, so they can look at the screen and read. Um, they, you can, they can spend time on focused listening. Um, I will admit that writing is an area that I need to develop um, and it can uh, it's a little bit difficult for them to show me their writing sometimes because um, they, they may need to turn off their camera um, in order for them to have uh, good access to the internet. Um, that's something that I discovered that they need to have their cameras off um, sometimes uh, for connectivity issues. Um, so they can't actually show me their writing. Um, and then having them orient their phone to their page. Sometimes they're showing the top of the page or the bottom of the page. Um, and so it's hard for them to show me the text. So writing is an area that I need to develop. Um, the cell phones, however, lend themselves to um, reading and speaking and listening. Okay, so as I said, calendar and weather, those are the things we spend a lot of time on. We do the question of the day. Um, my weekly content is built from a website called ESL Library. And just as a note, um, it is not free. Um, it's, uh, I believe it's about $7 per month. So $84 for the year and it's billed yearly. So it's not terribly expensive, um, but they have like pretty rich content for adult literacy learners. Um, and they use line drawings, uh, which, you know, I sort of negotiate, do I wanna use all line drawings or do I wanna mix it up with some Google images, um, things from other open source resources. Um, so, yeah, so content is from ESL library and that's supplemented with Google images, my own photos that I take here at home, creative commons or any other openly licensed and public domain images. Okay, um, our distance learning platform that we use for proxy hours is MobyMax. Um, and they, that is something I'll talk about a little bit later um, that we use primarily to gather time for our program outside of class hours. And um, I do send some other websites to them via WhatsApp at week's end. 
Okay, so I'm just going to show you some of my routines. As you might notice, the background is free of clutter. I uh, use pretty simple text and images. Um, so here's my today is. And the font size is uh, 31. So I want them to be able to see it, not have to struggle with the small screen. Um, so I use 31 or larger in terms of size. There it is. So there's the question, how is the weather and some images. Okay, what is the season? And these are things that um, they can do as they're filtering into the class. Um, it's part of every day. They can, I, they can pick up um, right where, you know, they, whenever they enter and they know what they're supposed to do. Okay, so here's our how are you feeling slide. Okay, question first, then answer, and our emotions that we've already reviewed the vocabulary for these. I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm tired, I'm, and I'm excited. <laughs> they like that one. I do shuffle questions, uh, most, most of which they've been exposed to. Um, a significant portion of class is allotted to these routines not only for the level of comfort um, and extended practice with CASAS components and our TIF and, TIF and CCRS uh, speaking and listening skills, but it allows them to settle in. Okay, so now um, I'd actually like it for you to chat out some of your routines that you use with your beginning level learners. While they are doing that, Jamie, there are a number of questions in the chat. Would you like to take those now or would you like to wait? I would actually like to wait till the end. There is a slide that's dedicated for questions. Perfect, no problem. Okay, so I'm gonna take a look at the chat here. Looks like word from the world. Vocabulary word of the day. Good morning, everyone, to make sure I have uh, everyone written down on my attendance sheet, calendar, agenda, name cards. Wow. Uh, cool down speaking exercise at the end, talking about a picture. My learners come from all over Southwest Metro. It's fun to have them share the weather. Yep. Questions, conversations, what did you do yesterday? Also day date weather, yep, and pictures. Great. Annotating PDFs, adventures, books, workbooks. Okay. Calendar math, um, evidence-based reading instruction, comprehension work with writing, simple close sentences. Yeah. Great. Again, want them to feel comfortable as they come into class. Plus vowel review routine. Yep. Joke riddle with pictures. Excellent. Greetings first, then are you ready for learning? Oh, I like that. Um, it, to assess their readiness for learning, are you in the frame of mind that you need to be in? to do school. And phonics, vocabulary, dictation, question of the day. Yeah, warm up activity, phonics lesson. Okay, we'll take a few others here. Weather, how are you dressed today? Okay, yeah. So linking clothing vocabulary to weather. That's wonderful. Their chat notes included. Okay, someone's asking are their chat notes included in the recording that we'll be able to access later. So I can speak to that. We, we actually won't be sending out the full chat log, but we could certainly gather them um, and make them available. So yeah, let me think about how we can do that. Okay, great. 
warm up questions based on the same picks all week with slight changes to the question of the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll talk about uh, using the same pictures or vocabulary throughout the week. Again, that's based on the in person routine just now in virtual format. Warm up um, agenda slide, then weather, days of the week, and calendar. Yeah, so those are some pretty typical beginning level. Yep. Nikki does one-on-one -on -one at Lindale. Daily message uh, with day date, something happening in the community or world, and then they practice reading. Flippity word cards. Well, I'll be interested to learn more about those. Five phrases each day from Tim Brzezinski's first 100 words. We talk about what makes a sentence and transform phrases into sentences by adding words and, and punctuation. We also use it for fluency, writing, and pronunciation. Great. Okay, I can take a few more and then we're gonna move on. Flippity is free, used with Google Spreadsheet, allows you to make flashcards or vocab words. Wonderful. Oh, Craig, hello. <laughs> Former colleague from Cedar. And he says there's an option to save chat here in the message box. And Amy said we can definitely grab these ideas and add them to the coffee break notes. Okay, Laura posts a question on Jamboard and have students respond to it. Okay. Okay, great. And so Andy said we'll save the chat and we'll add it to relevant material to send out. Great. Okay, so I think at this point we're going to move on. Those are some great ideas. Okay, so I'm going to break down my calendar of routines here for you and we'll start with vocabulary. Again, um, my content is built from ESL library um, supplemented with open source images and Students see one image at a time, kind of like flashcards. Um, they would be physical flashcards in class, uh, so we didn't have the technology to project them, but now they see it on their screen. And the, uh, the unique opportunity that cell phones bring to this is that they can really focus on a smaller amount of text on the screen. Um, the information is presented in manageable chunks. So again, my text size is at least size 31. Um, and it's added after viewing or discussing what they see in the image. Okay. And oops, I'm gonna go back here. Oh, yeah, so I'll just show you what that looks like here. So we would discuss what they see and it is the hobby of gardening or garden. Okay, my favorite. This was from a unit on hobbies. Crochet. So again, the, the pictures um, appear first and then the text. And here we have knit. Okay. Uh, use a computer. So as you can see, um, the line drawings are supplemented with um, real life pictures. That's I would prefer it all to be real life pictures, but you know, I use a mixture of both. Okay. 
So that is what vocabulary routines look like. Now we're going to move on to phonics, which would be on Tuesdays. So I choose a few frequently occurring sounds in the weekly, weekly vocabulary, and uh, we create uh, CVCs or consonant, vowel, consonant to uh, segment and blend sounds. Um, we practice uh, classroom directions to minimize distraction. So listen or listen and write, no, don't speak, that kind of thing. And um, I supplement with a website called ABC English um, and Moby Max sent via WhatsApp. Um, so let's, I send the link to them. So again, text is presented in manageable chunks using a large font. And so there's not a lot of distraction going on in the background. Google Slides allows for um, animation by paragraph. So I can present one letter of a word at a time uh, to practice segmenting and blending sounds. Um, sometimes we'll sort uh, into word families with charts. The thing with that, though, is when you have a blank chart, um, there is an annotate function on Zoom, and uh, that can be hard to view on small screens. So again, I have to be sure that I'm using, I believe, uh, besides 36 there for them to see. I had a student tell me once that he, she was holding her phone up, she couldn't see it. Um, so I use a font size of 36 or bigger, and it only goes to size 48. Okay. So here we go. Um, this is an example. You know, we start with what letter, you know, and I'll call on individual students first. Um, you know, they appear one, one at a time, and then we do it again. What sound? Um, and I'm calling on individual students separately. Okay, so here's our classroom instruction here. What's she doing? Listen. All right, so that gives them directions on what they're supposed to do. Okay, and so here's an example of uh, building CVCs based on the, that selection of sounds. So here's H. Um, I'll ask, um, I'll go down the list of students that I have and I'll ask, okay, what letter, what sound? Okay, what letter, what sound? What letter, what sound? And then, um, so that you see if it kind of jumps there. Okay, then they'll kind of collectively say, ah, t, ha, ha, ah, t, and then we put it together in hat. So the animation function on, uh, in Google Slides allows for that to happen. That's Ben, that's my cat. <laughs> so you know what's coming next. We're going to see, k, a, a, t, Ah, t, k, k, at, cat, right? And we go through that. Okay. And this is um, a next section. And so they're going to listen and write. And that's usually like a dictation of spelling. Um, there are a few other activities that we'll do, like um, sorting them uh, into word families uh, or uh, segmenting, um, oh, sorry, that's for vocabulary, segmenting by syllable. But I'm going to move on to conversation. Um, so it's an I do, we do, you do approach, similar to what you would do in in-person instruction. Um, I show them one item at a time. It's difficult to uh, show them one word at a time, but it's question first and then the answer. So, okay. So it, it's a closed activity with pictures um, as a large group followed by pair work. Um, and the thing with pair work is I don't do breakout rooms because my students are just getting used to using Zoom um, so I'll 
put them together and I'll, I'll mute everyone else, but it'll be just those two doing the pair work, but we practice as a large group first. Oops, let's go back here. So a unique challenge of cell phones here um, when we're doing conversation are incoming phone calls <laughs> that cause disruption. Um, it, it, you know, and especially if the pair that I'm calling on suddenly has an incoming phone call, uh, you know, then I'll need to go to another pair. Uh, and it can be noisy if they don't have their phone on silent and even vibrate. You can hear, still hear that in the background. Um, I will talk to their family uh, if I know of their situation, if they, they have someone I could talk to about working with them to practice muting and unmuting during the speaking and listening portion. Okay, so here's our question. Do you, and then that gets supplemented or replaced by a uh, vocabulary word. Answers, yes, I do. No, I don't. So we practice those. Um, and I'll do that orally with them and they'll repeat. Do you garden? Yes, I do. No, I don't. And I'll go through the list of students asking them that question. And, Okay, so here's our vocabulary. Do you use a computer? Again, it's one, one image at a time. Do you sew? Do you garden? Do you crochet? Do you spend time with family? Do you paint? Okay. Okay, and finally, we're on sight words and fluency. Here. Okay, so it's a picture story. Um, and then this is just my process. So I read it aloud, they see only pictures, um, show each picture, and I call on one student per picture to tell me what they see. Then I show them out of order. They reorder it, writing the corresponding picture, a uh, corresponding number to the picture. So they, I, they'll either show me um, with their cell phone or they'll tell me if they don't have a camera to use. Um, and identify sight words in the text. And we review classroom instructions to uh, minimize distraction. So again, a challenge is having them orient their cell phone to show me the writing. Um, so they're not actually showing where they wrote the thing. <laughs> um, so, uh, and in these stories, they're uh, practicing scanning skills to find sight words. Um, I'll ask guiding questions with each picture to elicit vocabulary. What am I doing? What is he doing? Um, and they're critically using critical thinking to reorder and tell the story. Um, yeah. So, and again, internet spotting this sometimes doesn't allow for camera use. Uh, so they need to tell me rather than showing me. So here's, that's me, um, but it'll be picture first, but it, you know, I crochet. Here's, I make clothes. So I tend to make these stories pretty personal, either about me and my family or about other students. <laughs> he uses a computer. Yeah. So it's, uh, again, it's pictures first and then it's text. Um, and I will use the annotate function to put numbers in as they tell me. Um, so th these are just some examples uh, from a story that we put together. Okay. So. I actually would like to, um, before we move on to the next last part here, um, drop the link for the unit on the crochet curriculum. So but this is a, this was a unit on hobbies and out of that, my students told me they wanted to learn how to crochet. So I put together at least like one unit on or one part of a unit, it's still a work in progress on, uh, and I've piloted it already with them on learning how to crochet. So um, if you'd like to take a look at that, it, it looks a lot like these materials that I just showed you, 
um, with some extra materials in there that you can uh, see and use if you'd like. Okay, so then we're going to move on to the Moby Max part of it. I will discuss Moby Max here, but um, I, I do send links to ABC English at the end. Um, so like they'll get, I'll assign them something and I'll send them the, the link to Moby Max, um, but then I'll also send some other stuff to them. So um, at the end of every class, um, I use screenshots of the login process. We go through this every day. <laughs> Um, because by this time, um, they're pretty restless uh, and they might need to do some multitasking, which is fine. Like, I mean, that's, that's the mobility of cell phones. They can multitask at home and that's an opportunity that cell phones bring. But when it becomes an issue is when the cell phone is too mobile and they're doing things like getting up to make food, going to the bathroom, that's happened, um, or even driving. I, Amy had a student who was um, actually driving and in class at the same time. So um, it, so they're, maybe they're not paying attention to the directions um, or they might ignore my text and WhatsApp or forget that they need to look. So this is why we always review this. <laughs> um, so we, and I will guide them through it online together. Uh, we go through it together using my, um, I have a teacher account there, so I'll show them. And I send the link via WhatsApp after class. And again, we review this every class period. So um, so I don't have this linked right here because it's for my, my own class, but we do, this, this would be a hyperlink that we would go to. Um, so, but we're not gonna go there together now. Um, and below this would be their list of names. So we go, okay, we find your name. Um, and so this would be my account which says welcome teacher. Um, and they select the bicycle and the bus. And the thing will be their, their assignment. Um, and if they wanna do more than their assignment, okay, you click on the library thing there, that icon. And that'll take you to that, which is the library. And that will boot shape right there is around um, the things that we that we do. Um, that, that's what they should pay attention to. So again, that's just a close up of what they should be paying attention to when they go in. And not all of them use the, the Moby Max. I have a handful now. I had two who really were good. And out of a class of nine, I would say about half of them are using it right now, which is good. Okay. So then um, just before we get into our questions here, um, I'd like to recap a little bit of uh, what we've talked about in terms of unique challenges and opportunities that um, cell phones bring to beginning level uh, skill instruction. So they're familiar with WhatsApp. They can focus on smaller chunks of information um, if you limit the words and images on the screen. And the ability to be mobile and multitask while at home is, is something that cell phones bring. The challenges, however, is that they could be too distracted with these at-home tasks when they're too mobile. Um, difficult to use the annotation features on small, sometimes damaged screens. And orienting the phone to show work um, is, is tricky. Um, and then the incoming phone calls can be a distraction. So now is the point where I'm going to take questions. I've got a little collection of questions going so far. Okay. Um, so. I think it was Julie that wanted to know what apps work on Androids. Um, like if students have no internet access, the question was, um, she knows that I've, is that I, no, it's not iPhone. FaceTime works on iPhones mm -hmm. um, and was wondering what else works on Androids. Um, 
So that's actually not something that I've explored too much in terms of apps um, with my students. It, it's more getting them used to um, a few things, the WhatsApp and the Zoom and not having to worry about the other stuff. Um, they, I do send them to external sites sometimes, um, but that, that's it. <laughs> Um, at with the level that I teach, I'm not I'm not expecting them to to use a bunch of different apps. Um, and then there was a question of an example of the question of the day. I can't remember if you threw in a slide after that question was posed that had an example, but maybe another example a of a question of the day. Yeah. Um, so the how are you feeling might be a question of the day. Um, question of the day uh, might be related to something about last week um, that we covered. So like, or I think we had something like, do you, do you like uh, crocheting? Do you like gardening? Yes, I do. No, I don't. That kind of thing. So I use it as an opportunity to review past content as well. Um, another question was from, I think it might have been Julie as well. How to answer their, how are they answering your questions? Are they texting? Are they using the, the whiteboard or when so, you post the question? Yep. Um, so it's all oral. Um, I, I mean, they're seeing the, the question and the, and the images and stuff. And so I will call on individual students. I'll call on uh, the pair to practice the conversation together, um, you know, or sometimes they'll just shout out answers <laughs> to me. Great. Um, where do you get your photos from? You mentioned ah, um, open source. Yep. Um, so the ESL library is where I get the, um, and there's the, there's a link in resources at the end for that too. Uh, like that's where the line drawings are located. Um, I take pictures at home uh, for some of my stories. I go to Google Images, but I it, it, you have to go to the advanced part of the search to be sure that the images you are using are free. Um, and then uh, the Creative Commons has a few um, things as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Jillian just posted a question about how do you send a Zoom link to someone who's going to use their cell phone? Um, she's used them with, she's used Zoom with students with computers, but not with cell phones. Um, so I have a link to the ongoing class and uh, that link gets sent out, um, so it gets copied and pasted into a text and that gets sent to them uh, via WhatsApp or if I have their home phone number just in my phone. And uh, they, when they sign up for class, um, we're fortunate to have staff who are there to walk them through the, the getting on Zoom process um, in their phones. And so as long as they have that link, they can get directly to my class. Um, and then I think the last question I have so far is from George. Do you have a way to use letter blocks online to spell out words from phonemes? Or maybe I shouldn't have said words, but to spell out phonemes at least. To spell out phonemes. Um, mm -hmm. I, well, actually, I mean, I think you might actually touch on this and part of your thing with some of the phonics stuff that you do. Um, so it, ABC English really allows for that kind of thing. It's, it's difficult to create them uh, or have students practice moving the, because I'm I'm in control of uh, what they see on the screen, right? So it's it's very teacher led in that sense. Um, but the ABC English I think allows for some manipulation of of that stuff to create to use sounds to create words. So okay, I think we covered uh, pretty much all of the questions that were posted, unless I missed something, no, which is um, easy to do. <laughs> we are right on time. So all right, awesome. Okay, so um, I believe if Nikki can request access, remote access here. Um, yep. Wonderful.
Okay, thank you so much, Jamie. That was really great and helpful. Uh, again, I'm Nikki Olaldi, and like I said, I'm the beginning ESL instructor at Lindale Neighborhood Association. And I do teach low through high beginning um, in class uh, 153 to about 200, but on cell phones, um, our participants mainly follow within the 180 to 200 CASAs range. Uh, we are doing lessons on just strictly cell phone, like a regular cell phone with no video or uh, some learners with WhatsApp. So this isn't moving for me. <laughs> if I, I'm unable to get this screen to move. Um, can you request um, remote? I thought I did. That's yeah, I thought I granted it. <laughs> Nikki, the, Nikki, hover down to the bottom of your screen until that toolbar up, appears. Yeah. Um, I don't see it yet. Go ahead. Hover down until, or maybe Jamie needs to. And then you'll use the, for the first time, you might have to use the arrow key on the screen, not on your keyboard. Hmm. Not showing up, huh? Unless someone could just click for me, that would be fine too. Yeah, I can go. I can go. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so just a little bit about uh, Lindale's uh, context. Uh, we are a um, part of a neighborhood nonprofit in South Minneapolis, and education is one of our programs. And so we are a community focused place space, meaning that um, we are located where most of our learners are. Uh, we do not have a central site, like a central like uh, school site. Um, we have a very strong volunteer pool, dedicated long term volunteers um, that collaborate with us and have stayed with us for many years. Um, some of the challenges, like I said, no central site. And um, in 2020, we lost access to two of our three partner sites for various reasons. And our third site that we have access to, we actually do not have access to now uh, because they're holding uh, distance learning for children in there. Uh, majority of our students lack internet access. Uh, so synchronous online learning is not an option for most. And um, we are a team of two. So we're doing the teaching, the intake, the outreach, all of that. So uh, a little challenging. Uh, next slide. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, so we reached out to the students uh, very early in the pandemic and looking to see how we could best serve them. It became uh, obvious that uh, most learners did not have dependable access to uh, devices besides cell phones or internet. Um, we're uncomfortable with technology. And we knew that they were at the beginning levels or literacy levels of English. and. Um, we're at high risk of illness because our uh, learner base tends to be older. So we had asking these questions, how do we best serve them? And what we came up with was uh, learning by cell phone and WhatsApp for some. Okay, next slide. So why telephone-based packet instruction? So just to rewind a little, what we do is we create uh, packets of uh, student materials, mail them out to learners who are in the uh, remote instruction program and provide uh, detailed lesson plans to our volunteers. So about three quarters of our volunteers decided that they wanted to continue to work with learners every week, twice a week, every week. Some have multiple learners. Uh, why? Uh, number one, maintain connections with students who are unable to do internet-based remote learning. Uh, we wanted to meet the learners where they were. Uh, we certainly did not want to count anybody out uh, just because they didn't have access. 
uh, to a device or um, the internet. Two, this is a unique opportunity to focus on listening and speaking skills that became evident right away um, that while you know often listening is hard to do, it could be challenging to do in class uh, at the beginning levels, that this is actually a really good opportunity to focus on that. Uh, three, um, continue to provide assistance to those who may feel isolated. Uh, many of our learners uh, live in uh, apartment buildings where they're asking the residents to stay confined to their apartments, blocking off common spaces. And so this is an opportunity to have um, an outlet a couple times a week. Uh, four, learners can really dig into skills and concepts at their own pace. Um, obviously working one-on-one, -on -one, you can go however fast or slow um, that you need to. Five, uh, learners can focus on themes that are of interest to them. Of course, when we started, we had one theme. We started with shopping, but as we went along, um, we have now nine units that we've planned for. And as learners have entered uh, the program, they could choose what they would like to work on. If they wanna work on uh, uh, work or health, or um, we have a goals unit, uh, they could choose that wherever they are, we have the lesson that meets their needs at that time. And it allows us, number six, to maintain uh, connections with our volunteers. Uh, we would, we want them to come back. We, they're a major part of our class. And so this keeps them involved and in actually teaching as often as they do is like constant professional development. Um, so we've seen some great strides and everything. Uh, next slide. So uh, a typical class is uh, meets twice a week, approximately 60 to 80 minutes. Um, we have in the beginning about five to 10 minutes of check-in and free conversation, 20 minutes of analogy phonics, uh, 10 to 15 minutes of content review, 20 to 30 minutes of new content and five minutes of feedback. We definitely want to be giving um, solid feedback uh, to the learners and also get a sense of how they feel that things went. Next slide. So and I'm going to talk about our first routine, which is a check-in and conversation, which is about five to 10 minutes. Uh, if you could show all of those questions, that would be fine. Um, these are some questions, these are not, these are a sample, these are questions from day one, unit one. They evolve. Um, this will give you an example, if you could take your time, uh, I'll give you a second to look at them. So this is copied directly from a lesson plan that uh, we post in the Google Drive for our volunteers. Um, it's a starting point. It's not the same questions we ask all the time, but uh, I gave the volunteers an opportunity to gauge um, where their learner was at, um, if they needed uh, help with something, if they were having any issues that um, my coworker and I needed to um, identify and uh, provide some assistance with. Uh, also at the bottom, you can see it says, can you ask me some questions? When you're starting off the uh, conversation routine, I mean, especially I think with the beginning levels, you know, the learner is accustomed to responding and having the teacher, I think, be in the, the teacher role. They're gonna ask and I'm gonna answer everything. Um, but this was an opportunity for us to start um, flipping it to get learners accustomed, not only to answering questions and being in that receptive, but being in the productive role of getting information that they need. And so we started out by just saying, if they don't ask you these questions, if you see it in red at the bottom, um, just tell them, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing that every day. I like, this is my hobby. And, um, over time, what we've come to see is that uh, students are really opening up or have been opening up. And sometimes 
we've seen the conversation part, the check-in go 20, 30 minutes. I've had several times volunteers say, sorry, Nikki, we didn't get to the lesson. We did all conversation. And I think that's fine. Um, like I said, we're able to tailor what they want because we are, they're working one-on-one -on -one and we have so many units now, which I'd be happy to share with everyone, by the way. Um, so it's, it's what they need. And it's a unique time to do that uh, once we're back in class. And of course you try to do it as best as you can, but not everyone, I mean, when you're back in class, you just cannot have one-to-one. -one. It doesn't usually work that way. Uh, next slide. Um, so in this presentation, we're talking about opportunities and challenges to using cell phones. And then for this routine, um, a unique opportunity is an opportunity to establish a speaking and listening routine, allowing learners to speak without being rushed. Uh, what I mean by that is sometimes, you know, class moves on or uh, there's, you know, other outbursts in class. Uh, but this is just kind of like a quiet opportunity to do that. Uh, opportunity to connect with a native English speaker. Um, doesn't have to be a native English speaker. Our volunteers are all native English speakers though. And talk about topics of interest to them. Uh, some of the challenges uh, doing a conversation on cell phone. No visual cues, especially if you're just doing cell phone only, which to approximately 25% of our participants uh, in this uh, remote in instruction, our cell phone only without video. So it's really forces them to have to listen heavily. And it could be challenging with uh, maybe background noise and distractions. If you're using WhatsApp, poor internet connection, internet, you know, because what we're finding is those who are using WhatsApp are like connecting to just general cell, but don't have their own. So it could be spotty cut in and out. Uh, the screen could go gray. Um, just because uh, students uh, have an opportunity to speak one-on-one -on -one as long as they want, they still might be apprehensive to engage and the conversation could be repetitive um, because all of us are pretty much doing the same thing for the past year. So maybe there's not too much to add. Okay, next slide. Second routine, this is something I um, introduced in November so months after we started, um, analogy phonics, we do do phonics instruction um, based on the unit that we're working on and the vocabulary that's relevant, but um, wanted to include analogy phonics because we noticed that learners were having difficulties decoding and not having that regular phonics routine uh, in class. And so, um, this just allows us to have some very simple, uh, you know, sounding out practice, uh, establish uh, some strategies uh, for making sense of, or, or like I said, sounding out words that are unfamiliar. Plus I saw it as an opportunity to teach some words like column and row and um, numbering the words so they could maybe almost like a bingo, like a B4 or a C2, uh, which I hoped would translate to reading tables and charts and filling them out. So um, we'll be just seeing the results of that shortly. And we also do spelling practice from it, which we did in class. And so that we were able to do that spelling routine and the phonics routine now on the phone, which um, we in class had in the beginning and we're able to do on the phone. So just because you're on the cell phone doesn't mean that it's everything has got to change. Uh, next. Um, some of the unique opportunities, you could provide detailed feedback uh, on the learner's difficulties as they arise, meaning, you know, we definitely know um, what they're producing as, but in class, um, you know, you might have some more vocal students shouting out, others just copying, you know, repeating what they said. Two, we can go slowly, as quickly as they need. Um, and the learning learner can gauge uh, reading success in real time. Challenges, of course, unable to provide visual instruction or fixes on pronunciation troubles, especially on telephone. What I mean by that, if you're using, um, you want to use your mouth to show them how to form the sound. You can't do that. 
Um, it lacks a kinesthetic component if you're using letter tiles. Um, someone made the comment in Jamie's presentation to, you know, spell out words or help with uh, the phonics in some way that's not available. Um, and pronunciation by listening can be challenging, especially if you can't distinguish between two sounds. So just listening and hearing the volunteer say something again. And again, doesn't mean that it's magic and it's gonna happen, but okay, next slide. All right. Um, so these are some of the materials we use uh, just for content. As you can see, um, they are just, um, they're copies from textbooks. So we're doing it opposite at Lindale instead of like making our own uh, materials, putting them on PowerPoints, which I think a lot of sites are doing, which is really great. Um, since we're putting so much time in the lesson planning and the meetings with the volunteers, um, we don't haven't had as much time to generate our own materials. So we're using these, the same thing you can use. If you're using copies of textbooks, you can use the same thing. And um, try to use colors uh, because it generates a lot of uh, language. And about 90% of what we do in the beginning level on the phone is just speaking and listening, speaking and listening. So we are not doing as much writing. It is difficult to gauge writing on, um, um, on even, even if you have WhatsApp or FaceTime because of maybe difficulties using, you know, the, the rear facing camera, trying to hover the camera. So try to do, this is where we could do more. Let's take advantage of it. Um, and also learning these uh, WH question, you know, learning who versus what, when, where, even how much, how many can help with conversation. So I'm trying to, we're trying to tie all of it together. We learn these words will help us with conversation, which will help us uh, more in class. And those that are working on the phone, hopefully we'll, we are seeing increased confidence in the learners. Um, can bring that back to class and uh, will help us going forward. Um, yeah, and as you see, there's a, a lot, you could probably just look in there and see there's, there's a lot of questions to ask. Um, and we come back to these. We certainly, we have them saved on the drive. We come back to them whenever it seems like the learner needs uh, help. And, it, and like I said, on the phone, one-on-one, -on -one, it's great because um, you can come back. You could stay on something longer. Uh, next slide. So um, the previous slide was more picture focused and this is we do have, we do use text um, and we can practice with WH questions all the same. Um, sorry, this. Uh, all the same here, uh, instead of asking, you know, how much, what is, based on the picture, now they have to scan. So they're able to uh, scan for specific information. They have to listen for the word and match it um, to the evidence they find. We've also added a question, why, why, why? So we're trying to get people to demonstrate how they know um, a little bit of CCRS in there. Um, okay, next slide. Okay. This one is uh, from Literacy Minnesota uh, curriculum on checks or checks and money, I believe. As you can see, it has just two questions on there. We've been able to stretch this out into several class times. In addition to practicing, you know, who wrote the check? How much is the check? What is the date? This is a really good opportunity to pra practice directionality. Um, I know I've had challenges in class saying, look at the top of the page, look at the bottom, hold the page, it's in the middle of the page. When it becomes difficult, I just point, point. It's so easy, right? Um, but um, being on the phone, you have to listen, right? You have to um, be able to express in a different way and you really forces you to learn this. Even if somebody had WhatsApp for this activity, we ask that the volunteers don't use the video. Um, and again, so that way, you know, uh, where do you write the date? Uh, 
where do you uh, write the name? Um, where do you write the money, the dollar amount in numbers? So we practice with top right, uh, middle, bottom right, um, things like that. So that was pretty challenging, um, but ha not having that video, um, just using the basic technology of cell phone uh, has allowed us to see uh, where these gaps are, but and to really iron out some some basic points. Uh, next slide. Again, um, a little more of the same, uh, just to show that this is from the community unit. That check was from the money unit. Um, we could still practice with directionality here. And so we're really trying to cross them and then reference in our plans to see other documents um, to review the information again and again. Um, and this can tie to the uh, shopping unit with the colors. I mean, there's a lot that we can do. And then we're not just, we encourage um, our teachers not to just be asking questions. After you ask the questions, whatever set of questions you're asking, flip it. And so the students have become accustomed to switch. They know switch and they know, okay, now they have to ask the question. And it's, and it's not a given that it's gonna be, you know, form correctly, but it gives them a chance to model those questions um, after. So we ask questions, we switch. It's constantly switching back and forth. So it's definitely, as much as we can, we're trying to have put it, um, the control in the learner's hands. Uh, next slide. Uh, finally, um, this one lends uh, something like this lends itself well to placing an order on the telephone. You know, we're ordering in nowadays, um, placing an order on the telephone for what? Um, being uh, specific about what you want. And they put a little snippet there on the bottom um, from a table, hoping to connect um, like the columns and rows that we did in the phonics to um, writing the information in um, a table like this. Um, so there is writing in there. And again, you know, how would we know that it's correct? Uh, you know, they have to tell us it's the first line. First line under beverages, um, under sandwiches, number two. They could number the, the, the rows across on their paper. And then they could tell us, you know, line two under sandwiches. So just whatever that you would do with pointing, using words, using words. So, uh, okay, I think that's for now. Uh, if you wanna chat it out, um, I mentioned a couple of ways that uh, cell phones and WhatsApp can facilitate skills acquisition. Um, what are your thoughts and how, you know, having this limited technology, not having, um, you know, the use of like other apps can facilitate skills acquisition. If you want to chat that out, I'll give you a moment. Nikki, um, I have a couple questions that have come up in the chat already. Great. Yes. Maybe we can do that while people are putting out their chat. Um, Holly was wondering, I'm not sure if I'm saying your name right, so I'm sorry. If it's possible to send videos to learners for pronunciation practice to see their mouth I'm sorry, movements. You, you broke, could you say that again? I, I, you broke up. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Is it possible to send videos to learners for pronunciation practice to see their mouth movements? Um, and then she clarified too with a follow up. Um, specifically wondering if sending videos has been done with students who are phone only instructed and are they able to access videos? Um, good question. Something I've been thinking about and I know that it's been done. Uh, definitely want to explore that. We haven't done that a lot. We've sent out some videos and then um, found that it was challenging to access. And I'm not sure if it was issues just knowing about the click and how to operate the video once it's open or if it was a connectivity issue. But definitely I think that would just add another dimension and not 
to phone warning. So I think that's a great idea if they can. Okay, then I'll let you look at the chat and I'll stir up the rest of the questions for later. Okay. Um, okay, I was wondering, are you, are you scanning, uh, Vicki asked, are you, are you, you are scanning, uploading these pictures from books you have already? Yes. Yes, we're doing that. And then uh, we make packets and mail them out. Uh, Jean says that she, uh, or that uh, they wish that there was more beginning materials with, that included ethnic food. I agree. Some of these books look pretty dated or not very contemporary. Um, Adam says, uh, if someone has a cell phone, they can use their cell provider signal data network to view access anything on the web or sent through the web, even if they don't have internet at home. Okay, good to know. <laughs> um, good way to keep students engaged and learning during the pandemic. Becky says, Tammy says, students might become more comfortable talking on the phone, which can be scary. Uh, might become more comfortable talking on the phone, which can be scary for them. I agree. Um, I think just doing speaking, if you any second, third, fourth language on the phone is just infinitely more difficult. Uh, many of my students, Craig says, many of my students use uh, WhatsApp to communicate with their families. I hadn't thought to use it as a learning platform. That's great. Yeah, they love, uh, the students love using WhatsApp. And uh, if for some reason the WhatsApp's not working, they're very upset. So they do like that. And, and so it does take out that piece for having to use your words for everything. I mean, you could eliminate a lot with a point. And worse, using the words for everything is not necessary, but it is, it's a way to take advantage of the situation. Um, Donna says she sent videos through WhatsApp. Carmen says she, I keep finding ways remote learning is valuable. One is that it reaches learners where they are. One called in from the hospital after she had a baby. Another is that students are gaining digital literacy because they have to struggle. I agree. Maybe we can use them to teach tech problems so we can see students while they are using a different device. Good. I'm thinking there's a lot of scanning, you know, using, there's a lot of scanning for specific information, you know, skimming to get the general idea. I mean, a lot of the same thing. Um, still miss in-class instruction, but uh, in the situation we're in, you know, I think it's important to look at the benefits that we can gain from it. And uh, we weren't sure how this uh, project would go. It's still going strong and students are wanting to enter it. We haven't lost any volunteers. We decided this isn't for me. And we've even brought in some new volunteers who had never been in the class um, and we're doing telephone only. So uh, if, if you're in a situation that, that this is uh, maybe the best way to reach students, it, it can work. And like I said, I'd be happy to share some more additional materials that we have. So uh, next slide. So is there any other questions? Uh, we're gonna take a break soon. Um, Patsy, how do you share volunteer uh, resources with volunteer? Oh, you're asking me. Uh, we put, um, we give them access to, uh, we have folders in Google Drive and um, they click on the lessons in Google Drive. We also mail them out, but most of them just access them and um, teach from there. Uh, where do we store lessons on Google Drive? Um, so we've had to give everyone access, but it seems to work fine. I thought maybe more would want paper, but they say they're fine. Some use two computers. Um, many volunteers have more uh, time on their hands, so it's uh, due to the pandemic. So it's a good use of their time. Is it? You know, many of our volunteers are retired, and it was a very important part of their day. Uh, and this is a way for them to stay involved. I mean, they're here for the students and they're still here. They were here for the students before, they're still here now for them. So, um, and for some of our volunteers who are concerned about coming back in the classroom, they could continue this. And we probably will continue this in some capacity even when we move back to in-person instruction. Okay, uh, it's time for our break. So um, 10 minute break and um, we come back, we'll hear what Amy has to say. Thank you. 
Thanks, everyone. And just a note, I put this in the chat, but there's been a lot of great sharing that the slides for today are already in the participant folder. So if you're trying to keep up with all of the links that are being shared out, they actually are already there and you don't have to worry about it. So um, we'll see you in 10 minutes.
hopefully you got everything taken care of that you needed to on that break and check the pets and the kiddos and the coffee and everything else. Um, I'm going to be doing a slightly higher level than what Jamie covered. Um, so if they if students kind of graduate from Jamie's class, they come to me next. Um, but I still consider myself beginning, high beginning, uh, definitely not intermediate. <laughs> so the, uh, the students in my class range from CASAs 180 to 210. And we are also working on Zoom on cell phones. And yeah, one of my students has a computer, but that's it. And uh, I, we've been using Putting English to Work Packets. That's an approved distance learning platform that has packets available for students to work on. You can accrue proxy hours with it. Definitely kind of outdated, also free. Um, so that's been working actually pretty well for my level. Um, it was a little too hard for Jamie's level. But um, then I also am supplementing with read work stories and choosing generally level kinder kindergarten level once in a while first grade, but that's actually really too hard most of the time. A typical class for me looks like eight to 12 students meeting on Zoom. We, I, most days I have one, sometimes two volunteers uh, pulling students out into breakout rooms with uh, anywhere from one to three students in a breakout room. I start out with 30 minutes of math, which I tell the students is kind of optional, but most of the students come to that. And then we do two hours of English, uh, working with Zoom and mostly using Google Slides and sometimes the whiteboard, whiteboard feature. And then afterwards, I make myself available to stay after to help students mostly with catching up with packets if they've gotten a little lost or confused or behind, or some, sometimes to do some assessment, reading assessment and things. I do expect the students to do some homework. So they have a schedule of over two weeks, they do one to two pages of a packet Monday through Thursday. And ideally they would do 15 to 30 minutes of Moby Max most days. Uh, it doesn't quite work out that way, but we're still working on increasing their Moby Max usage. So at this level, I do ask students to do some more independent learning and kind of work on those time management skills and kind of make time to complete out of class tasks and to evaluate their ongoing progress. And one way that I've managed to streamline my link sharing is by sharing a Wakelet with them. So I'm just gonna quickly go to my Wakelet so you can see, this is just a simple place to collect. You can curate a list of links or upload resources. So here uh, is a vocabulary practice for our current story, some phonics practice that I'll look into more later. Um, and then at the bottom, they can watch the video that goes with our putting English to work packets. They can, a few students, the higher level students, um, some of them actually go into ReadWorks and get proxy hours that way and access stories that way, and then Moby Max. So we practice that frequently and it simplifies things so I can just share one link at a time with them um, rather than sharing all the links and having them kind of get buried in our group chat. So I really like working with math and numeracy. It's kind of a growth edge for me and my students really like it. It's kind of the only place they're gonna get that early math foundation, you know, for those who are wanting to go on for more education. Um, it's also a great place for them to practice using their language in a new context or with new communicative tasks. One of the favorites that you may have come across is from Steve Wyberney. It's called Splat. So in this picture, they um, I put a lot of the writing in there. I put top, bottom, left, right in there, and the students can explain to me how they know that there's nine dots there. What groupings of dots did they see? and how did they add those together? Or did they just count one by one? So we talk about that for a while and then comes the splat where they have to figure out how many dots are under the splat and how do they know and try to use English to tell me what they remember and try to use math words to try to explain it all. So I give them some sentence frames and some vocabulary for our conversation. Then it's a big reveal, you see what's under the splat. And so these slideshows are available 
Um, you can drop the link in the chat to other resources as well besides the slideshows, but they're available on PowerPoint and Google Slides. And they, as I say, they build in difficulty. So it starts out pretty simple. Another goal I had for myself was to start teaching estimating because I feel like that's a really normal life skill that students need. Um, but I realized that in order to teach estimating, you have to teach rounding. I had really never taught rounding, I don't think. Uh, but we had a blast teaching rounding. Um, I had to be very explicit. Like initially I was like, if the tens place is zero dash four round down, but zero to four, like they needed to see zero, one, two, three, or four, like um, to really see. And um, we practiced with different places. So this was kind of a fun way to practice the ones place, the tens place, the hundreds place. Um, first, I would have them identify, like kind of slow down and not um, tell me just the answer. What's the answer? Some students want to quickly answer the question. But first, they would identify what number is in the tens place. And then they could round to the nearest hundred, which is still kind of an abstract um, direction. So I would give them the hundreds on the bottom. And we would look at, you know, 540 is between 500 and 600 and lots of English um, that goes around this. And also part of the inspiration for this too is that there's lessons in MobyMax around this. So if I could teach um, the lessons and kind of build up their ability in our class time, then they were able to do the MobyMax lessons as well. This is um, another numeracy or math exercise that I've been playing around with. This is a simplified version where there's just two word problems and two answers. Each answer is used one time, um, but this gives them a chance to really practice understanding what does plus mean? What does times mean? What does it do? So even if we're not, um, even if we're not really learning the whole multiplication table or practicing all the division, because some of my students really aren't there yet, they're getting exposure to times and division, and also to the language around it. So we're using that. So students here, they're not supposed to answer with numbers right away. They're supposed to tell me the function. And students, we're, we're working on Zoom, but then they open WhatsApp on their phone and they go in and they um, take a picture, send it to me all in WhatsApp. So they're really comfortable with it. The few who aren't can get some support in the office um, for that, or students can explain it to each other. So all throughout my class period, students are sending me either pictures of their notebook or they're sending me a text for the couple students that have broken cameras. Then I tell them to write the equation and support them with a little prompt. Um, once they get the equation written, I mean, this is a whole process. Um, then we can go back and write it out in English and read the whole word problem again and read the answer again. So I give feedback just by chatting right back in WhatsApp. Um, I'll also orally, I will just say their name, like, you know, so-and-so you need to try again for a number. And then, um, so it's oral feedback and it's also texting feedback for those who can read the text. You can also do a voice message feedback. So usually if I send a text feedback, then I'll also record my voice. I'll just mute myself and record my voice if it's lengthy, but that's kind of rare. Um, so it's kind of building towards a more complex exercise where students can differentiate between the four operators and look at some of the language that is used for the different operators and just kind of, you know, help each other. Sometimes we come up with the word problems ourselves. So just a nice uh, change of pace, I guess, to, um, to be working with numbers and numeracy that way. So then the bulk of my online time is kind of based around read work stories, which I just kind of choose stories that go along with the unit for putting English to work that we're already doing with the packets. Um, so I have a couple of resources to share along these lines. I've been ma um, making slides with read work stories and then choosing photos that are shareable that I mostly get from photosforclass.com or the Creative Commons photos collection. And so we can put that link in the chat to the ReadWorks stories. Um, there's quite a few stories that I've uh, kind of put photos into now that are available 
for you if you would like to use those stories. And then also I've been making up slides that go along with a lot of the phonics and different activities. So I'll be showing you a few of the slides, but there's a collection of slides that some of them are easily reusable. Some of them would need to be tweaked or maybe just inspire, um, but it's kind of a time saver. So I'm showing, I'll show you like a lot of things that I've created over months and now I just reuse them. Um, and I am actually on Zoom. So I'm not on WhatsApp anymore. So I'm not texting, talking and videoing with a group just to answer the question in the chat. I'm in Zoom, but students will, while they're in the Zoom class, they will open WhatsApp. They seem to be able to do that so they can open WhatsApp um, to show me their homework. So this is something, this is a story from ReadWorks with a picture that was super relevant for my students, which are mostly um, from Ethiopia and Somalia. So I'll start out every story with some conversation, like what do you see, what do you remember? Um, and that's a great time, another time saver kind of thing to just sometimes great stories will come out of here. Uh, like later on, you'll see it from a storms unit, uh, there was a, some hurricane stories that came up, um, nothing too tragic, thankfully. Um, so I do try to avoid you know, tragedy in stories, but every once in a while, um, great stories come up. And uh, this was just a kind of a simple one, but it was relevant to everybody. So you can collect these stories and reuse them for listening or for reading, but mostly it's just preparing them for their um, for the story that we're going to read. I really like to, I only have two languages usually in the, um, in my class represented. So it's possible for me to do some translating. So we hang out here for a while. When we were in person, we used to get onto Google images on their phones and Google Translate or the online Aromo dictionary. And now we can't really do that, but I'll model, I'll turn on my video and model like, hey, I've got my dictionary, I'm gonna look up this word, or we'll go into Google Images and search for something or go into Google Translate. And so that just gives students opportunities to kind of develop those strategies for like when they see a text or a word that they don't understand, what are their options? You know, besides just not knowing, like where can they look? They can just search for an image. Um, and that's something that, like I say, I was already doing in class before. So some of the students actually can do that on their own, even though it's a higher level skill, but otherwise we just do it together. Um, I have quite a few students that just do, you know, look at the initial sound and guess at the, the whole word, kind of make an educated guess based on what they remember from the story. So I like to break apart the words and really focus on here, you know, usually two syllable words um, for this exercise. And we can do different things on different days. So I get like four days worth of usage out of this. On the first day, students can just shout it out. On the second day, I can ask individuals. On the third day, um, they can text me the answers or write it in their notebook, take a picture, send it to me. And then on the last day, you can take away the initial, the first half or the second half. Um, and if they're struggling, you can give them some support, right? To kind of prompt, give them a hint <laughs> as to what it might be. So that's something that, you know, I'm mostly sharing things with you that students have given me really good feedback about, about that they value. Um, here's a story from ReadWorks again, where we're practicing reading fluency. And this goes, we do it in class, but then it goes to volunteers. So volunteers can practice and listen. So students get more like one-on-one -on -one feedback. But this is another advantage of WhatsApp um, that in class, students can open WhatsApp, they can record themselves reading and I can listen to them later if I can't listen to them all at once. I, and I wouldn't want to listen to like, you know, 30 minutes of students reading, but you can selectively listen and then give feedback or kind of get a sense of maybe what your class needs by rotating through which messages you listen to, but then they all get reading practice. I also can record myself and send it to them along with a PDF of the slide so they can um, study it and look at it at home within their WhatsApp text messages. So that's something that we kind of play around with that is already something that they're familiar with a lot of them um, for communicating with families, with their family members. Um, 
this kind of builds on my students mostly come from oral cultures and I found that on the phone they're really able to hone in on their listening and speaking. So even though this is a reading one, it's recall. So they're recalling what we read in the story, which probably they were getting so bogged down in the text that like it was somewhat like comprehension was actually really hard. And so we'll go through and highlight the verbs one day and then kind of collect the verbs here and then go back another day and try to recall like how were these verbs used in the story. And then um, some students can remember and some students can't. So we'll go back for the ones who can't and find it. And then they're responsible for that one sentence to recall it. And they're, you know, most of them have memorized so many things, you know, that is a real strength of theirs. So they kind of memorize a sentence. And then usually we'll just do five at a time, not all 10, and then retell the story um, with each student remembering one sentence. So that's something that students have also, it seems to kind of help them process what the story is about a little bit more. Then we do get to kind of typical comprehension questions and trying to hit that key shift of finding evidence in the story. Um, this was one that was about saris in India, which is an interest for a lot of my students. So I, I thought this might be a good story to work with them on. And the question that I posed with this one was just, um, what shape is a sari? And it never really told us in the story, but it did have pictures and they had some prior knowledge. And then in the story here, it says, you know, it's 30 feet long or it's a long strip. And so there's enough clues really in the story for students to be able to um, indicate how, what, what in the story could, um, could help them answer that shape question. And also teaching those shape words, which are always a little hard. So then I always have time for phonics. And one of the things that has been a time saver is there's quite a few slides that I'm not sharing here because they're so repetitive um, that are just kind of similar to this or they're about initial sounds or digraphs and different things that are in the link that we shared earlier about the root the collection of routine slides. But this is one that is always nice. You can do with like the clapping or I'll do like bump, bump, bump. You know, we'll do it with names. We'll do it with vocabulary from the story. Um, just kind of working on word stress and syllables. And we get a lot of usage out of those, <laughs> those story slides. So here's one where we'll go through and find either the short or the long vowels. And this is the final version. We did it together. It's just a screenshot where I was using the annotate feature and highlighting, having one student find the short A words, another student find the short E words. Then I, after they were highlighted, the rest of the students could just read the short E words, kind of like that. So. Um, the lines were just there to help them tell me like where the word is that they were seeing initially before we had them highlighted. And this was an idea that I stole from Kylie Kunkel, um, who I think did it more with like sight words and maybe phonics words. But this was a story from um, about Martin Luther King Jr. that we did recently. And you can see like unfair and law and spoke and dream. And those words were kind of challenging, even just to read, much less to understand. So we translated some of the words, but then um, we went through and I put the story words in red. And then another time we just looked at all the ending sounds and just practiced reading the ending sounds, which was challenging for even for my students, for most of them. Almost everybody had some kind of mistake. And then here, this is again, the final version. At first it was white, and then we highlighted all the old words, and then we highlighted all the eat words. And then once they were all highlighted, then students could read them again. And as far as I know, none of my students are colorblind, but you know, even if they were, you wouldn't have to rely on the colors. It's just kind of an extra aid for some students um, to, that might learn better by seeing it visually that way. And then I had uh, just, recently kind of explored this website again, this ABC English. I was familiar with it before, but it looks like they've updated some things. Um, and our evening literacy teacher has used resources and the books that they sell too. But this is kind of great for my current phonics, uh, what I'm trying to focus on, um, looking at the endings of the words and looking at word families. 
so here it's just old, right? But then it goes on to cold and it takes away the ending and shows you a great picture for it, which is often the challenge. Like we don't all need to recreate finding all the pictures for everything. And this is a word family that I'm studying with the students. So it's just a great way for my students that are more on the 180 side and not so much on the 210 side of CASAS to get a little support there. And you can share those slides with them. Um, you know, again, assuming that they have Wi-Fi access, which I had commented that we were able to get some hotspots through the public library through a partnership. So we haven't purchased hotspots yet, but that's definitely going in our budget for future because hotspots have been a lifesaver for our, some of our students that haven't been able to um, have good Wi-Fi. So something to consider for programs that can. And then again, I do have volunteers and I'm the volunteer coordinator. So I had to be an early adopter of volunteers just to have a place to put people. Um, but if you think about it, my students are getting, you know, 15, 20, up to 30 minutes a day with one or two volunteers. And so in one week, you know, they're getting like an hour, if they're coming every day, they're getting like at least an hour of individual or maybe like with one other person time with volunteers, which is just a really great connection point uh, for people who are maybe isolated a lot of the time and not getting out nearly as much. And of course it's great for the volunteers as well. So. Um, these are a couple things that I've done with volunteers. I took quite a few out, and again, they're in the routine slides, um, slideshow that we shared. But I really like follow up questions, and it's really quite a skill. So I'll give the volunteers, I'll change this up or let the volunteer change it up frequently. But the highlighted word, you know, is supposed to get repeated. They're supposed to listen and then ask a follow up question. And then the next one is always. Um, just an open-ended one where they can make up their own questions and answers and switch it up and, you know, not necessarily like a different person can start. Um, and there was a great session yesterday that was much more detailed than this about how to kind of create roles and have this be more student-led. I'm using this with volunteers, so it's more volunteer-led, but the volunteer tries to get the student to lead as well as um, listen for something to follow up and build on the conversation. And it's supposed to just kind of keep going. And then every once in a while, we do practice that in class. Then I've had a couple intern volunteers who need projects. And so one thing that we've done is from those read works, what do you see? What do you remember times? We kind of get a sense of like when there's more stories to tell. So when there are more stories to tell, which there were about tornadoes and hurricanes and things, um, then we took a minute to let the students work on some writing. So with the volunteer and with me too, but you know, the volunteer would again, read the story and then have a story frame where some of the more beginning writers were just going to get through the first couple lines. Um, and some of the other writers would get all the way to the end and have some open-ended story time, but they would do it talking first. And you know, getting them to not just exactly copy the previous slide is always hard, like even orally. Um, so trying to free them up to just, first of all, just tell the story and then kind of work within the frame and then go beyond the frame. Something that um, one of my volunteers was working on. And then I also have the volunteers take them out to WordWall, which is, um, it is it's subscription based if you want to create a lot of your own activities, but it's free if you wanna just create your own activities. And also there's tons of things that you can access for free that are publicly shared. So that's what I mostly use are the free publicly shared activities. This is one example where we're trying to differentiate between short and long. Or here with the volunteer working with the students, this, uh, the student or the volunteer can say bug and then the students can identify if it's short or long because the students, I mean, it's building that vocabulary but they don't necessarily know all the words yet either. Um, and this is also something that you can share as a link. I will, sh not all my students successfully do this, but about half, you can share it as a link and then they can do the activity on their own. So we've done that with past tense verbs that they really like. So we made it through my slides and we have a little activity here. So we've been dropping little challenges and advantages of working on cell phones throughout our session. 
And this is a link that we would like you all to click on. And I will stop talking probably for a couple minutes while everybody clicks on that link in the chat and then goes into WordWall to try out WordWall, just so everybody, in case you've never tried it, knows what's available there. Because this is something my volunteers have really liked, my students also. Um, I'll go into it too, just in case anybody has, oh, for some reason that didn't work. Oh yeah, so I'll go into it too, just um, in case anybody's having an issue or is on a phone where it's not working. There's lots of different activities. Um, this one is a sorting, so you can read. Some of these are almost listed twice as advantages and challenges. And we had an equal number originally, and now it's an unequal number. So there's actually more challenges than there are advantages now. And I've never seen it this way. I've only ever seen it with an equal number. So it's interesting because I don't think the advantages side is going to get filled up anymore. But once you have sorted it, then it will give you an option to submit. So multitasking at home could be an advantage or a challenge. We put it as an advantage because there's another one about getting distracted. Oh yeah, distracted with home tasks. We kind of like made that both because <laughs> that's been such a thing. So clearly I'm not done, but when you are done, you can um submit your answers and that'll tell you you know which ones are correct or which ones are wrong but what i want you guys to do when you finish is go over here to the side where it says interactives and then show all i create yeah holly i created that activity with the free version i'm maxed out you only get to create five activities and so i've already created all my five activities um, and I'm probably not going to upgrade. I'm probably just going to keep using other people's created phonics activities because that's mostly all I need. But you can edit your activities. So I can go back and edit my activities with totally new content and keep using it. So you have permanent access to five activities that you can redesign, but that's kind of a lot of work. So let's try, I don't know which one. Let's see what quiz looks like. Is quiz the one I just had? Oh, quiz is often the one that I use for um, for cell phones, if I know students are going to do it on their own and there's not a volunteer to kind of like help make sure they can see because quiz, the quiz activity narrows it down to just one thing at a time. So you can really see one picture or one word at a time and then make a choice. But, and some are games, like there's an airplane one. Um, the anagram one works for spelling but it would be silly in this case. I'll just show it to you to show you like how silly it would be in this case. Oh, look, it's making me spell advantage. So it doesn't always uh, work out. So you have to like try which one might work the best. So I'll go back and I think it's time for some questions for me. There's resource links that are getting dropped in the chat, but these are all available in the presentation materials. Um, most of the things have been covered here. A couple of Marn Frank's um, resources are listed in there as well. Uh, so, Amy, yeah. we have some questions mm -hmm. uh, from Mark. He wants to know how you give, how do you give feedback? So yeah, usually um, I'm giving feedback with a text on WhatsApp. If if students are texting me like their math answers or some kind of answer, then I'm texting them back like yes or try again or great or something like that. Um, otherwise, it's mostly oral in the class. Sometimes it's individual with a phone call or, you know, I mean, if it's in class, I'm not probably going to call them. But like if they need more specific feedback, then we'll stay after class or I'll call them on the phone. Okay, uh, we also have a question from Linda. She wants to know, how do you talk, text, and video with the group at the same time with WhatsApp? So before I started teaching on Zoom, we were only teaching on WhatsApp, um, but it wasn't 
synchronous. It was it was asynchronous in terms of the whole group or it was synchronous with small groups. So two or three students at a time. I can't remember what the max is now if it's up to four people to four or five on a group video chat. But I have abandoned that completely and now I'm just doing um, Zoom class. But the students will go and open WhatsApp on their phone during the class. So for that moment, they'll lose the visual of the screen or the whiteboard and they'll be in WhatsApp and responding um, or texting or sending me a picture. And then they'll just close WhatsApp and then the Zoom screen generally will pop back up. So there definitely is you know, a lot of digital literacy skills going on. But the interesting thing is that because so many students already were using WhatsApp, it's a little bit more doable to use WhatsApp during the Zoom class. Uh, and Sydney Sanders says, Amy, you do a wonderful job of including anti-racist practices in your class, including relevant pictures and stories, honoring native languages and showing vocab words in their languages, honoring oral traditions, so. Oh, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, and just an, another little tidbit was that like, I, I think I was just so sad to have to stay home. And then I just was trying to create like a lot of beauty as much as possible. So I'm always trying to just have, I was not that great in the classroom of having photos or, you know, certain things that I'm trying so much harder to kind of like brighten all of our lives a little bit. <laughs> uh, Lorna uh, has a question. Is it somewhat distracting to have students go back and forth and for you to be checking responses while teaching live? Usually we're kind of um, like with math, it takes time there. They have five to 10 minutes to answer something and the answers are coming in, not all at the same time. So it's a little bit busy on my end, but I think on their end, um, oh, I guess that's what you're asking. So yes, sometimes mm -hmm. it is distracting. <laughs> sometimes I'll have to say, um, you know, tell somebody, somebody's asking me a question, teacher, teacher, you know, and I'm over here trying to quick respond to the person that just sent me um, a picture of their homework. And so I'll say, but I'll just explicitly say, just a minute, I got a picture from Hawa and now I'm, you know, I will just narrate what I'm doing and why I'm not responding right away. Lorna loves your phonics work and your sentence building activities also. <laughs> yeah, and there's so much more actually to be done in WordWell in terms of with the anagram one for spelling and sentence building. Um, it's great to check it out at least and see what other people have done. Uh, Jillian, she says, sorry, but I'm still struggling with how to get a Zoom link to someone's cell phone. Do you create the link on your computer and email it to the student? I tried it on my cell phone Zoom app, but it was not able to text the link or even copy it. I just copy the link. Um, you know, I have a Zoom account. I go into my meeting, I copy the link, I paste it. In, as a text message. I mean, it would work as a so regular you do it text on your message. Phone. Yep, okay. I do it on my phone. I, I don't, my students are not, mostly not using email much to my knowledge, certainly not all of them. So I just text them. Usually I text them in WhatsApp, but if I weren't using it, I would just send a regular text. And Andy says the link should work when you download the app to your phone. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, and we are lucky at our site to have um, translated text support. We have um, a speaker of um, Oromo Amharic and another speaker of Somali and Arabic. So, I mean, students go into in person, get some tech support, which is not available everywhere. We still have about five think... minutes if you have any more questions or comments for anybody. Yeah, we plan to finish a little early um, just so that if there were final questions that came up for the first two speakers or just broadly, um, this would be the time. Well, as you might be formulating a question for our speakers, I just want to thank them so much for sharing their expertise. How much good stuff was just shared. Thank you very much, Jamie, Amy, and Nikki for taking the time to put all of that together and sharing this morning. I also want to remind people and continue to use the chat if you have a question for any of our speakers um, or for the group. You've got a lot, you've got over 70 people here with some 
amazing experience that we could probably crowdsource your question. Um, but just a reminder that at 1130, there is a low level coffee break that uh, we put on the screen here for you too. And Maya and Elizabeth will be um, hosting that. So join us for that. And again, the links so much was shared in the chat. We'll be cleaning that up and making it a little easier to read and getting that into the participant folder as well. And the participant folder already has the slides from today with all of those clickable links. So we'll hang out for uh, just a couple more minutes if people have additional questions. And I want to thank Andy for being our tech backup and our interpreters for making this session accessible. All right. Thank you so oh. much, everyone. Lorna, I was just going to respond that I, I do use article a day. Um, I assign it to my students, but not all my students get in there. I don't use it in my classroom, but I do assign it. And a few students are accruing proxy hours in ReadWorks and actually use article a day. I will go ahead and stop the recording, but we'll stay for another moment if people have additional questions.